guys, welcome to episode 50 of the Grappers Academy. Uh, if you're on Spotify or Apple, I don't know where 47 or 48 are gone, but we'll get on that. And get yeah, that. They're lost in the ether somewhere, <laughs> yeah. but um, they're out there. It might just be bonus content on YouTube that you've got to go and yeah. search for. <laughs> yeah. So if you can find them and come back to us and let us know what they were about. That's it, definitely. Yeah. They're still there. I'll, uh, yeah. I'll get them yeah, get those up. amended. Which is a beautiful segue that reminds us at the beginning to talk about go and check us out on the Spotify and the YouTube. There we or go. Or the Grapplers Academy. Going to get that in early today rather That's than it. leaving that to the end. Right at the beginning. Podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, all of that. All the good stuff. All the good stuff. All the good stuff. All the juicy squeeze stuff. If you've not. <laughs> Complete inside joke. If it was the first time that anybody's listening to this podcast, it's not an OnlyFans podcast. The Juicy Squeeze isn't uh, a Craig Jones stolen technique. It's, uh, it's one of Sarah's special techniques. It is. Um, but today we want to talk about, because stuff's opening back up again. Yeah. Like we've been saying for the past couple of weeks, months, two years. Uh, so there's going to be plenty of people stepping onto the mats for the first time. Mm. And we've spoken about it a little bit before. We've got another podcast on it if you want to go and listen back to that. We did it a bit earlier last year. But talking about new people and beginners coming into grappling. And we've both got a, quite a bit of experience with that. Uh, and we want to share that with you today and just give you some helpful pointers as like somebody new coming into jiu-jitsu yeah. to get you on the right path with it early on and not hinder your progress early doors because you see a lot of people coming in and doing stuff that slows down their learning yeah slows down uh their ability to pick up stuff quick and makes it for want of a better phrase like not that enjoyable mm. uh, because they're, they're either getting frustrated or they're feeling like they're getting to be up or just they're not they're not getting it yeah i think um before we get into that i think uh could be a good session to start with uh, like sort of etiquette as well for the gym um because we can sort of breeze through those we'll get the key points then we can really elaborate on the sort of training techniques because like it's common that you see sort of especially with new beginners they come in with like the wrong training gear start off in like loose t-shirts and loose tops um nails as long as like blades yeah hygiene's a big one yeah Hygiene's a big one. You've got to you've got to have short nails. You can't be cutting your training partners no. like in, with these skanky nails. It's fucking, it's fucking disgusting. <laughs> uh, we, we, I think there's a whole other podcast about that as well, isn't it? Yeah, there? I think we went on a big tirade. <laughs> Just, I mean, as a point of general hygiene as a human being, cut your fucking nails. Yeah. And don't let any potatoes grow underneath there. Um, like women might have longer nails just from a fashion point of view but they're, they're going to scratch people Yeah. Uh, whether you mean to or not you know you might be doing collet, drilling collar ties with somebody um, and they try and shook it off like it's going to cut the neck Yeah. and that's on you that's it and it's not it's not nice to sort of especially for the person walking around with it afterwards as well like it's always in really visible places and it's kind of like nobody wants to walk around with scratch marks on the back of the neck and the face and yeah and if you've stuff. got a if you've got a partner who's not understanding about what jiu-jitsu is try and explain that one away yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other that the other plus side of having trim nails is if you're doing gi yeah grabbing the gi it is very easy to bend the nail back oh. at the very least you might rip your nail off if you've got a bad grip and somebody strips that grip, or you've got a good grip and somebody strips the grip and you've got long nails, are you going to know about it? Bye bye fingernail. Are you going to know about that it's one? It's just then so your fingers are not like a potato rather than have them grow underneath it. Yeah, so, and that, that counts for feet as well. Like, I yeah. think feet's more of a hygiene one. Um, at some point in jiu-jitsu, you're going to have your feet in somebody's face yeah. and you can have somebody else's feet in your face. I guarantee if you're on the receiving end of it, you're going to wish that they've got nice clean trim nails mm -hmm. so return the favour oh definitely yeah. and uh um, yeah t-shirts like you said just before i go on that one yeah like, you, you made a point about baggy t-shirts but is there anything wrong with like you know it's not football we don't have to wear a uniform but the, no. the reason being for wearing loose clothing is kind of similar to what we were just talking about about the the nails getting caught on stuff like people's feet can get caught up in yeah. t-shirts and um you know you just want the material to be close to your body so that it's easier to do the sport yeah and um, you're not getting stuff caught or wrapped up um 
you just making it a bit safer as well because like fingers can twist the wrong way. Yeah, um, I've seen toes as well go. Yeah, toes. Like, so. And even I've seen it where um, someone's hand and wrist got caught. Yeah. In like a loose t-shirt, so like an ideal situation, like a rash guard is better. You can get them cheap from Decathlon, like a couple of quid a pop, or just wearing a relatively tightly fitted t-shirt so there's not enough loose fabric and the rash guards are more hard wearing mm-hmm. like you're gonna rip a t-shirt yeah. like regardless whereas a rash guard if it gets caught it's just gonna get stretched and ping back t-shirt gets caught it's just gonna rip the threads and if you like the t-shirt you won't like it anymore <laughs> If you've been getting absolutely jacked over lockdown on muscle bands, yeah, you know, your resistance band training, and you're coming into the gym in your medium t-shirt, you're probably <laughs> going to be all right. Yeah, your, your fucking flex bodybuilding t-shirt where you can. Oh, they, they could rip it if they flex too hard. Trying to get out of a bi- uh, an armbar and bicep curling. Another positive benefit from having the, uh, the rash guard. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? Uh, take a pair of slides or sandals as well, um, mm. purely for the ease of getting on and off the mat. Uh, because inevitably you're going to need to nip to the loo during the session. You're going to need to jump off the mat for whatever reason. So having a pair, of, bit of footwear that's easily accessible rather than having to put shoes on, take shoes off. And hopefully you're not in a place where, unless the gym is a no shoe zone, like I know a lot of places are, unless your gym's one of those, you're not going to be walking off the mat barefoot. So just bear that in mind. And again, that's from a hygiene point of view, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. So, like, um, you know, the easiest way that I explain it to people is, would you go and rub your face on the floor outside? The answer is no. Yeah. Well, your, your shoes are walking on the floor outside. There's dog shit, dirt, whatever on the floor. If you're bringing that onto the map, then you're essentially rubbing your face in the same mm. stuff that's on the pavement. Same with the toilet as well. Would you go and rub your face on the toilet floor? Yeah, exactly. Around the bowl? So, um, you know, it's easily done. Just basically put on a pair of footwear that you can protect your feet that you that are going to be on the mats from mm. the floor. And it keeps everybody happy. keeps everybody rash-free, uh, like... Like, nastiness-free. Like, what yeah, if, from, if you Google skin infections, like, staph, ringworm, they're the two main ones, really, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, cellulitis, I've seen, like, yeah... Just, you, you don't want any of that nastiness, like, getting into your body. So if you turn it up, turn it up with trim nails, um, preferably if you've got stinky-ass breath, some mouthwash. Yes. Um, <laughs> if you've got long hair as well, like, we're the Mitchell brothers, so we don't really, we're not, we're follically challenged. Follically challenged. But and if you have... To my advantage. <laughs> oh, that's it. Head, the... head stubble oh. is a tool that yeah. you can use to your advantage. But, Definitely. Yeah, if you've got long hair, tie it up. Yeah. Because uh, believe it or not, I used to have long hair down to my shoulders and people would kneel on it and stand on it and it's a fucking pain in the ass. And also as well, if, you, if you're if you not the person with long hair and it's tied and all over the place, you do feel bad if you're trying to put a cross face on and you get a handful of hair. Or if you're on bottom and you've just got loads of hair all over your face, like, I get it, hair falls out, but just do your best to tie it up. Yeah. Uh, back to the point on t-shirts as well like a loose t-shirt can be a really good weapon actually can't it oh yeah if you it's been a sweaty session and you can get mount on somebody you can basically waterboard just, somebody yeah yeah just basically <laughs> stick your sweaty ass t-shirt right <laughs> on the face and not move go for the old mother's milk on it <laughs> <laughs> that, that was one of the worst sessions i've ever had right um the guy would mount in me and i was just getting waterboarded by oh. his sweaty t-shirt and i wanted to tap Probably the most I've wanted to tap in any scenario ever because there was pressure on top of it as well. I was like, there's nothing, he's not, there's no sub. I can't tap. I'm going to lose face completely if I tap to this in the gym. So I basically just held my breath for as long as I could and tried to mount a defence. I'd have been bucking, bucking, bucking <laughs> and just dying on the, on the back. Like, no, no more. So it's one of those ones where if, if I've got to die, this is going to be one of those occasions <laughs> where I've got to die and I can't tap. <laughs> Um, if it's gi, you've got to, if you turn up to a gi class, like that's probably a conversation that you're going to have with the instructor beforehand, whether maybe you're going to borrow a gi, get mm. a gi from the club for the first couple of sessions before you get your own. Yeah. But you like, if you are going to turn up to a gi class, turn up with the gi, not like half the gi, you know, yeah. like a gi top and shorts or whatever. It's not Sambo. Um, it might, the, the, and the reason being is that that bit of 
the gig might be used in the technique that the instructor is showing today. Mm. So you don't want to be with your partner and be like, oh, well, they can't do it because I decided not to turn up with my gi top or without my gi pants. Yeah. Um, you can work around it, but you just want to make it easy for everybody. Mm. And another point on hygiene as well is wash your training gear after every session. Mm. Or if you don't want to do that much like laundry, don't wear the same stuff more than once in a week. So if you want to, if you've only got one set of training gear and you need to reuse it, it needs to be washed every session. If not, and you've got multiple sets of training gear, don't reuse it. Yep. And like you can get a Dettol washing liquid now as well. It works a treat for killing off any nastiness. Yeah, if you've got any of those stinky ass t-shirts, you don't want to be the guy who's got the, the stinky pits no. on the mat. And the best thing you can do for those is burn the t-shirt. Yeah. So, and so. as well, wash your belt. <laughs> wash your belt. Wash your belt. No, you wash away the gains. Oh, no. No, you wash away the gains. I'm not, I'm a firm <laughs> believer that all my gains are in my belt, which is why I wear it when I go out to the traffic stop. <laughs> yeah. Tucked into your jeans, just sort of like, hey. I don't know, around the head like a bad <laughs> Full Rambo style. Full Rambo style. Don't mess with me and my full, full strike my belt. <laughs> Actually, before we get on, I just saw a brilliant Reddit post recently. Um, it was about... So this guy was at a party and he heard somebody saying how they're a blue belt and how they could beat anybody with jiu-jitsu and this, that and the other. And this guy turned around and says to him, mm, they won't work on me, that stuff. I don't care, it's not going to work on me. So the blue belt challenged him to a, to a bit of a roll. So, and the blue belt was saying to him, let's start on the knees. So the guy turned around and was like, no, that's not how fights start. You're going to come to your feet. As soon as he got to his feet and this started, the guy that challenged him, or challenged the blue belt, pulled guard, inverted, <laughs> put him in the saddle, and got him to tap. And yeah, at the end of the story, he's like, I also forgot to mention that I'm a brown belt. <laughs> I mean, you can fucking play the rules. It's like uh, that joke about the the guy in the urinal, and he walks all the way down to the other urinal to have a piss to tell him that he's like a vegan or a crossfitter or whatever. <laughs> it's the same for jujitsu when yeah. people go hard for something at the beginning yeah. of a couple of years or months. Like that's all they want to talk about, isn't it? Uh, or like you have the guy who's watching the UFC and like telling you every detail about what's going on on the ground. The just bleed fans. Yeah. No. <sighs> Twist his dick. <laughs> uh, maybe that's what he was angling for. <laughs> Possibly. Maybe he's watched the Juicy Squeeze. <laughs> and he's also subscribed to Craig Jones only fans. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, don't be a dickhead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to do it. Any more etiquette points or like sort of quick points? Quick, well, it's a... Cause we've got we've covered hygiene, we've covered nails and sort of the training gear and footwear can't really think of anything else that initially gets covered before we go into the training stuff no i think that's i'm sure some, i'm sure somebody's going to tell us that we've missed something glare, glaringly obvious but yeah be clean yeah um and that, i mean that basically covers a lot of the points that we've just talked about yeah yeah be, be clean. clean yeah there we go the last 20 minutes of the podcast <laughs> like, be clean <laughs> Um, but what about when you were in the class and whether it's, well, we'll start off with how classes usually start and technique. So like, you know, when you, when you're there and your instructor is showing a technique, how as a student should you be acting? Me, I'm a big advocate of, um, students walking around so they can see different angles and see where things are supposed to be. And really trying to take it in from everywhere rather than just sort of sitting in the one spot and seeing it from which could be a really bad angle or just the same angle and they're missing details on the other side that they might not might be missing and i'm also a really big fan of questions if you don't understand something ask me because if you don't understand it there's highly likely that somebody else is going to understand it as well so if there's a question ask away yeah, I agree with that. Like the the, posi the position of watching the technique, it's very hard as an instructor to show a technique and show everything in three hundred and sixty degrees of how you know how it needs to be shown to the students. Um, so if you're if the if the instructor is showing a guillotine and you're sat at the feet 
and you can't even see what's going on with the neck, just get up and move. Yeah. You know, like it'd be better to have all 30 students at the head where the technique's being shown rather than just sat around in a circle. Mm. I've seen a diagram on this as well showing like basically optimal angles of viewing for a technique. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, basically goes from, it's like a traffic light system of red being like let's just say it's at the head and the foot of the instructor being the worst possible way that you can view it or even around the back mm. and then as you come around to the front where the instructors line themselves up to view the technique most optimally and you come into a nice big green zone where you can see what's going on with the hands and the oh, feet so it's like an amphitheater sort of thing or like yeah. an arena um the further away you are from the center of where the technique's happening the more in the red zone you are, mm. and then the more you come around to the centre, you're coming into that green zone to see the most optimal viewing angle for it. That makes um, a lot of sense though. So, I mean, you might, you know, your instructor might uh, change position during mm. the technique if everybody, like if you've not really got the option in the gym to move around. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've got no problem with people moving around, I think it's a good idea. Mm. Um, so, you, so questions as well. Yeah. Uh, just to, in addition to what you were saying, yeah, there are no stupid questions, but you get a lot of people asking questions that can be answered just by having a practice at the technique. Yeah. So like, I agree with what you said, but what I'd also add to that is like, maybe go away and have a go at it first and then either ask the instructor while everyone's drilling the technique or come back when, cause usually techniques are shown in a couple of parts, aren't they? Yeah. So come back to the second part of the technique and be like, oh, I was struggling with this bit. Like, you know, like how am I getting that? Or uh, is there something I'm doing wrong there? And maybe just have a go at it first cause you might answer your own question. Yeah, good point. Um, I think as well, um, when they're going back and drilling it as well, it's asking your people that you're drilling with what they think of it. So asking for constant feedback on how does this feel um, if it's a submission? And is it, is it tappable yeah. or train to the tap? Um, and yeah, just asking for live feedback all the time for your training partners. With it being such a sort of pressure based and balance based sport, you need that live feedback from, from the people you're training with. Yeah. I th uh, there's a difference in questions as well, isn't there? Like, um, you know, instructors show the technique and there's a difference between asking how should I have my hands to apply the pressure, which is a perfectly valid question versus, or well, if I do this and just shut that down, which isn't what's being shown. No. Or that might be the next thing of what's being shown. So mm. how many times have you gone and then go, oh, what if I do this? Or what if they do this? And you're like, I'm doing that next. Yeah. We're going to drill this bit first and then come to that bit <sighs> second. on a weekly basis. <laughs> yeah. It, and that's, that's quite frustrating, but the like, what should my hand position be? Mm. And then you just go, it's this, like, yeah. that, that isn't coming out of the scenario. So your instructor's showing you a specific scenario. They're not showing you with every technique, the completion entirety of jujitsu. No. Yes, what if somebody does this? Well, then you're going to do something else. Yeah. Of course. But like at the time, just learn the technique that you've been shown in that scenario. Mm. And then the likelihood is that within that session, you're going to learn a couple of other different things around that concept that will all tie in together. Yeah. And we'll probably answer your question. It's like, um, like when you see trying to cover open guard retention and you're saying, okay, we're going to do this from if the player's trying to pass standing and someone's saying, well, what if they try passing low and pressure style? Well, that's a completely another scenario and another lesson. Yeah. Like take away from the lesson what you can and add it to your arsenal. It's like, like anything, take what you like, discard what you don't like. Like, and you may come back later to the same technique and some of the stuff you discarded, you might think, oh, actually, I like that now because my outlook on the technique has changed. Yeah. And another thing about the questions as well, actually, before you, um, don't ask how to escape something if we're showing how to do something. So it's like, okay, we're showing uh, mount control. Don't ask how to escape from mount because that's going to be another lesson again. Like the offense, the way I coach, I teach the offensive in one lesson and I teach the defensive in another lesson just because it gives both of them enough attention that they, that they require. I'm not going to show you how to get into something and then show you the escape the next because then it doesn't give anybody who wants to work the attack that opportunity to do it because the escape's fresh in everyone's mind. 
Yeah, exactly. And to go back to what you said as well um, about taking bits that you like and discarding bits that you don't like, that's going to be easier for somebody who's been doing it for a couple of months mm -hmm. or maybe a year or two years when you're still still fairly fresh, but you've got a bit of experience and, and yeah. you're, not, you're starting to develop your style. It's going to be a lot harder to do that if you if it's your first couple of lessons. Oh yeah, true. Yeah. Um, so what would you say for those people who are coming in? It's like I, I can't see the wood for the trees because everything's such a new concept. Mm. I don't know how to discard what I don't like. I don't know what I like. I don't know what I don't like. What you know? How do you how do you filter all that information? To begin with, with that, I'm probably going to go against what I've just said about discarding what you don't like and just absorb as much as you can. Like, if you're jumping into this feet first, go home and watch matches, um, take notes so you don't forget what's been taught, um, really apply yourself into the lesson and just really try and master the techniques that are being taught without trying to jump too far ahead to the next thing. Sort of like really focus on the task at hand and get really good at that. So then when it comes to the next thing, or when it comes to learning it on the opposite side, you've got a better understanding of what you're trying to look at or yeah. what you're trying to learn. That ties me into a point that we might end up getting to later, but it's probably worthwhile saying now before I forget. Um, with anything that you're trying to get better at in life, frequency is the best way yeah. of getting good quick. So the more times you're doing something, the better. Uh, we talked about this before with people who, you know, like there might be a blue belt savage on the back that mm. trains twice a day. Versus the guy who's been training for four years, who's also a blue belt, but turns up once a week. Yeah. Um, more frequency is better. Not everyone can train all of the time. Not everybody can do two sessions a day, or even one session a day for that matter. They might mm. get two sessions a week. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people who train twice a week. Uh, maybe some people train three times a week. But that doesn't mean that you can't learn outside of jiu-jitsu. Oh, and it's yet. the same as everything. Like uh, when, when people come in, with questions, it means they've gone away and thought about the subject mm. and analysed it while they've been away, rather than just going home, switching off and not thinking about what you've been shown. And it's kind of like the reason you get homework, isn't it? It's very difficult to do homework in jiu-jitsu mm. because you've got no, if you've got nobody to train with, but your homework can be, like you said, watching matches, listening to people talk about jiu-jitsu, just exposing yourself to it more yeah. and getting yourself in that jiu-jitsu brain. So people who go away and think about it more are more likely to develop quicker than yeah. the people who are just going away and switching off. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to be thinking about jiu-jitsu all the time, no. but maybe just follow a couple of uh, jiu-jitsu pages. You might mm. see something that catches your interest and go like, oh shit, we did that yeah. in the lesson. Like, I can start adding that into my game now. And even adding like a jiu-jitsu podcast to your your podcast list or um, like if you're a big YouTube watch or listener and you you sort of like have it in the background while working have some jiu-jitsu related content going on so you can pick up some of the lingo you can get some athletes that you can look into um learn how to do the juicy squeeze <laughs> no, i'm just thinking like, you're picking up the lingo you sat there in the office and you just think us yeah us, us. <laughs> Oh no. And you, you're that guy in the mat, everyone sat around and it's three, two, one. And then uh, you're like, us. Nobody else said that. What's yeah. going on? Oh, fuck. Us. Oh, um, I mean, us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, chest. Oh, yeah. Corona. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? Like, uh, well, I won't, we won't get into Mackenzie, Mackenzie Dern's fake accent. She's obviously been watching too many GGC videos while she's been at work. But it's better than hitting those not safe for work videos when you're at work, whether you're working at home or at the office. Very true. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, to, to speed up your rate of development, be thinking about it outside of jiu-jitsu, yeah. uh, outside of the class. That's true for anything in life. You know, if you're trying to get fitter, um, think about stuff outside of that. If you're trying to learn a new language, practice that more outside of mm. just your tuition that you might be having. Um, so it doesn't have to like overhaul your life, just slot it in to your day-to-day -day routine. Yeah. So like everyone's doing a lot of driving or a lot of work from home. So like, and if you're listening to podcasts and things that you like, you, you can have it in the background. You can listen in. You are going to absorb the information, and it's going to give you that. Okay, we need. I've heard about this technique. I'm going to have a look at it on YouTube and see if I can get get what it is out of it. Anything more on technique in the lesson? 
Um, one thing I always say is add as many stages as you see fit. So if the instructor shows it and it, they look like they break it down into four steps, but in your head you're thinking, okay, they put their hand there, they move their hips this way, they put their foot there. That's That could be three steps in your mind, but the instructor did it in one. So add as many steps as you seem fit for your learning style. And then as you become more confident with it, then you can start to merge the steps. So then rather than being, okay, one, two, three, four, for those that are listening to this, it, I'm just moving my hands around. He's doing the Macarena. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as you get more confident, those four steps could just be turned into one. Yeah, and you do, don't you? Like, that's the natural progression of it. You, you trim off the fat and you smooth stuff out. Mm. Um, but a technique that, like you said, might be three steps that the instructor's verbalising because you're very new. Like, actually just sh getting your foot on the hip to shrimp yeah. to get the angle. That might be a whole thing that you're focusing on in of itself. Like, maybe you're not even at the point where you're focusing on how to do the arm. You need to focus on how to get the shrimp, put the foot on the hip mm. to set up the next bit of the technique. So you might be in that one thing where your partner's drilling one, two, three, you might be drilling sections of section A has a one, two, three, section yeah. B has a one, two, three, and then the finish has a one, two, three. Um, and then when you've got it, it's all muscle memory, you trim off the fat, you get better at doing it and it becomes nice and smooth, mm. hopefully. Yeah. Um, what about um, in the lesson? Or in people the, trying to be good training, training partners. And yeah, well, that's important for tech. That's kind of technique as well, isn't it? Before you get onto sparring, and technique is technique, and it's not sparring. So yeah, these and it's not even a fine line because um, you get some people who like this is the first one I'm going to cover. Don't be super resistant when you demonstrate when you be in a body for a technique. Yeah, but also don't be super limp. Mm. So if the person's like, if you're drilling sweeps from guard. Like, don't just fall over like a sack of potatoes. Yeah. Like, you're not doing your training partner any favour. Uh, if every time they just tap your leg, if it's a scissor sweep or whatever, and you're crumbling, they're not actually learning where to put the pressure or how to pull or how to push. Mm. Um, but equally as well, it's not sparring. So you've got to, if they're doing everything right, you've got to let them do it. Yeah. But if they're doing everything wrong, don't just fall over because you're reinforcing bad habits. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you're also negatively like giving negative feedback to good habits if they're doing it right and you're just resisting and being a bit of a dick yeah but it's like you won't work on me bro because i'm resisting it and it's like well we're not we're looking at it in isolation and it's like well the thing, the thing is that might be true you might have a good guard or like yeah. just the, the person's not good at it but guess what that's the that's why the fuck you're doing it yeah you're doing it to get better um if you went out in a driving lesson for the first time and you instruct yourself well take me on the motorway yeah and you've never even driven off your drive before that's <laughs> like it's driving bro it's real life go for it yeah it's like you're gonna have an accident you're not gonna learn and you're gonna be put off doing it yeah so that ties in with like making sure that you're doing it to improve and learn and have fun as well at the same time it's very frustrating even as somebody who's been training a long time if you come up against a training partner who likes to put a lot of unnecessary resistance into drilling technique mm. because you can't learn it like everybody's still learning even if you've done it for 10 years five years two years whatever like yeah. you need those low resistance reps that you can turn into higher resistance mm. reps that you can then turn into sparring that's and it there's a there's a pyramid isn't it there's like yeah. all, all the building base block of the pyramid is like your low resistance reps and yeah. then that comes up to high resistance reps where you may be having a bit more resistance and there's a bit more realism. And then the pointy bit of the pyramid or the spear is you drilling and you sparring yeah. and you've got to work it up. You can't just have, it'd just be very top heavy if it was all um, just resistance and you wouldn't have any good foundations to build on. There'd be no progression. No. And on techniques as well, don't get caught up on the submissions if you're just starting out. Like, Submissions are great and they are a, cool, a very cool part of the sport but you also need to learn how to get there before you can even apply them. So learn the positions, learn the passes, learn the control, learn your defence and then have one or two submissions in your back pocket to start off with and when you do go into sparring rounds or any sort of live rounds don't go full tilt 
until you've learned how to control your own body um because it is a dangerous sport and if you don't know how to control yourself and you're going into an intense round it's just asking for an injury yeah it's um knowing how to control your own body is one of the most if not the most important aspect of most sports but yeah. particularly jiu-jitsu um and that that, that yeah, that ties into a lot of stuff, doesn't it? Mm. Um, you know, you might, it might be your first roll. In some clubs, you might roll on your first time going to the club, yeah. depending on whether, you know, if you've not uh, joined the beginner's course, you might be rolling with people that are more experienced. And it probably is a bit intimidating. And, uh, like, the, if they're a good training partner, they'll just say, just do what you know. Yeah. And you might know one thing, and that might just be the thing that you've learned in the lesson today. And if it's a scissor, a scissor sweep, then the person, if they've been a good training partner, is probably just going to let you get them in guard and scissor sweep them over and over again. Yeah. And they might go to a couple of different positions. They might take you back. Like, they shouldn't sub you, but like they might put a sub attempt on. But they might eventually then work their way back into your guard and give you that opportunity to see mm. if you can drill it again. And it's just learning that loop. So don't, like if you've seen uh, flying triangles on the ground, like that's not the time and place for it. Learn... The, Practice what you've learned. If you only yeah. know one thing, practice that. Yeah. Like I always say to people, if I'm rolling with them and they're in it, they experience, what do you know? Mm. Let's practice that. Um, because you might think that you're a waste of the time of a training partner for them, but you need to get better so they've got better training partners. So That's it. it's, there, it's uh, important for them as well to yeah. make sure that you're getting better. Well, it's a delicate ecosystem, isn't it? Yeah. Like if there's no new people coming through, learning and trying to get better, the ones who are at the top and are the more experienced players or the better ones in the club aren't going to have a new feed of um, training partners coming through. And then when those new training partners get up to the top, they're going to want the new people coming through. So it's like just a really ongoing cycle of people climbing the ranks in the club and making each other better. Like it's, it's a solo sport, but you need to have a real team mindset to really get anywhere with it. I mean, that might not be immediately obvious when you're just starting off because you're just like, I want to fucking sub everybody. Mm. Um, but when you've been there a couple of years, like, and you're still the guy who's tapping out the new guy mm. on his first day, you're a dick, for yeah. one. Um, and two, nobody's going to want to train with you. No. Um, and then you're not actually developing any new training partners. So you become a leader, essentially, like within, the, you know, to the junior people in the club. And that doesn't just mean by age, it's by like belt or training experience or mm -hmm. whatever. And um, the higher up you get, the more you realise that you've got to look after and grow everybody um, that's coming up below you. And you want to, you know... Everyone's always trying to get more people into jiu-jitsu, so yeah. you've got to encourage people that are coming in and try and bring them along. Um, but that, like, before we get onto another point as well, that ties me into something that I want to say when we're on this topic, is that um, when you are coming in, if it's your first couple of times, like, have a simple strategy that is, like, your strategy at first should, shouldn't be, I want to sub somebody like you're saying, it should be, you're going to realise very quickly that your strategy is going to be, I don't want to get subbed. Yeah. And then you can bracket that, that down into something else. It's like, I, I want to be on top. My strategy is that I want to try and be on top for as mm. many as, and as much of the rounds as I can. And then you've got to think about what tactics you're going to use to do that. Yeah. So it might be that one sweep that you've learned, the scissor sweep. Well, now you've got a strategy that you can come into every session with. I don't want to be on the bottom. What's your tactic? Well, I know one move and it's the scissor sweep. So that's all that I'm going to do. Yeah. And then if I get put on my back, I need to try and regard to get to the scissor sweep, and now I'm on top. If I've got um, half guard, regard, scissor sweep, back on top. Mm. Whatever it is, there's going to be a way for you to get back to that one or two things that you know. Yeah. For you to practice and go through your tactics to employ your strategy. Mm. So uh, people jump the gun sometimes, and it's easy to do because, like you said, submissions are fancy. Yeah. And they're fun. Um, but the fundamentals, if you only know how to do a triangle and that's all you practice, if you get put in a position that you can't do it and you don't know how to work your way around into getting into a position that you can do it, you're fucked. It's like, you can't have fun without fundamentals. Oh, <laughs> oh is it? You can't have fundamentals without fun, whichever way around. Right? No, Mic drop. That, that doesn't work, does it? You can't have, does, does that mean that the fundamentals have to be fun? Oh, 
does it mean the fundamentals are fun? Yes. The fundamentals are fun. It is, it's in perfect honesty, like, submissions are cool, but yeah. it's like 1% of jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Um, being able to, if somebody puts you on your back, it's way more fun and frustrating for you to just be able to get out of their guard every single time yeah. and get on top. Like, and then take it back and start whispering, like, sweet little nothings into their ear. Did it again. <laughs> you can't hold me down. Can you escape now? Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> In, in, in my experience, it's more fun to be more dominant in positions yeah. or be able to escape out of somebody's strong position. Like, mm-hmm. if they've got a strong position and you know it's their strong position and you know that they like playing that game, if you can just escape out of it, it's so fucking frustrating. Yeah. That, it's like, they're like, why is this not working? Why can't I not hold you down? It's like when leg lockers became the, the next big thing and you got past the guard and they were kind of like, oh, I've got nothing left. Yeah. What, what, what do I do? I've ignored 50% of the human body <laughs> and it was the top half. No! Guard retention. No one's got past the guard. <laughs> um, but yeah, so like have, have a, your, your simple strategy when you start is going to be not to get subbed. Yeah. Because although getting subbed is a part of jiu-jitsu, it still feels shit. Yeah. So like when I first started, for example, I remember um, saying to myself like, right, I'm, not, I'm like my goal is not to tap more than five times today mm. and then it got to the point of like right i'm not going to tap once today and then it got to the point of like right i'm going to try and be on top now for the rounds and then once you can do that then you start to think like well, you probably have set goals by that point but like now i want to try and start subbing people yeah um you can't just go from first day in the gym expecting to come in and start subbing the people that have been training for two years no. uh, even if you're a ridiculously athletic person you still need to learn the techniques you might be able to muscle your way out of a lot of stuff well, this kind of brings us on to another point anyway this podcast could be about five hours long yeah it looks um yeah. but it's hard to narrow in on one point on this isn't mm. it um <laughs> turn me off turn me off the, the mic here mate. I'm, <laughs> but like i going off of the, what you're saying about the muscling like try to minimize trying to out muscle everything mm. so it was a bit of a vague statement but if you're in a bad position try fall back on the technique that you just learned so if you know if you're a mount you know what you've been learning mount escape rather than booking and trying to push your player off because if someone's experienced they're just going to seek their weight in and punish you for doing that whereas if you were to go back to what you just learned mount escape or whatever technique you've just learned and then sort of then start to apply a bit more pressure you're going to have a much more enjoyable time you're not going to be coming out of a five minute round and having to sit around out you're going to be able to be there longer and you're less likely to get injured as well if you're not trying to power out of everything when it's in a bad situation that was cool yeah but What's not cool is being the guy who's got away with muscling your way out of everything for 18 months on the people who are maybe more experienced than you, but you're stronger and you're just pushing your way out of everything. And you've actually not really learned any technique. No. You've just got away with being stronger. And now you either go up against somebody who might still be lighter and weaker than you, but they've got much better technique. Yeah. And that, now that doesn't work. No. And you're in an even worse position because you've been training for 18 months you've not actually employed any of the techniques that you've been learning. Mm. Somebody else who's been training 18 months but doesn't have the same power as you has not had the opportunity to just push their way out of everything. And guess what? Now they know the technique because they haven't got another option. They're going to be choking you. And they're going to be choking you out. It's like Uncle Ben says, the great power comes great responsibility. (laughs) (laughs) They make rice. Is that on the packets of rice? No, they're um, Peter Parker's um, uncle. I thought I saw that on that microwaveable rice. Talk about your microwave power. <laughs> yeah, I thought you was going on about like anything over t- uh, 850 watts. Shit. That's always, the rice is always undercooked. I always think on 500. Fuck. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, sparring. Sparring's kind of the final point of the drill, isn't it? And, yeah. Um, what I'd say for sparring, and you're probably going to hear it, is relax. Yeah. If you hear the words relax... if. If I say the word relax to you, what's the first thing that pops into your head in a sparring context? I'm being a dick. Yeah. 
<laughs> you're, going, you're going too hard. You using more energy than technique, and um, one key thing to look out for all the way through jujitsu is your breathing. If your breathing starts to get heavy and quick, and nothing's going on, you're exerting too much energy, and you're not thinking about what you're doing. Yeah, and it's a key sign for the person that you're rolling with as well to be like, all right, this guy's panicking a little bit, like, or maybe getting a bit excited. And it's like, <laughs> and obviously, my time's capitalising their fatigue. Yeah, like yeah. If, if you panic during a round or you you aren't relaxing and it's not gonna be enjoyable, and you're more often than not going to lose that round. Yeah, and you're gonna come out of it absolutely shot. Like yeah, yeah you're gonna be tired, aren't you? Mm. Yeah, you're not gonna have done really any technique. You might just like start digging your elbows into the person's thigh and like trying to f grind your elbow into the face. Um, because you want to just hold that position because you might be scared about getting swept onto your back. Um, it's a really difficult thing to do, but try and check your ego. Yeah. Um, is that it doesn't matter if you get swept onto your back because guess what? Now you get an opportunity to practice the technique that you've just done. That's it. Now you can get on top. Um, a more experienced player that you're rolling with might allow you to be on top and work more. It's because they're giving you the opportunity to try and work through things that you know, or maybe they want to see what you know and try mm. and help you develop on that. So like you might pass in a certain way and expose a weakness that they can then help you get better at. Yeah. Um, so don't think that if somebody just like sits on the back or like is reducing the intensity of the work, it's because you're smashing them and you're the world's most dominant ADCC champ. It's probably because they're trying to help you out. So don't get too tense. Keep your breathing relaxed and try and work on the techniques that you know. It's not It's not a time just to start grinding elbows into faces and stuff. Yeah, as well. So on a side note of that, if an experienced player does relax and slow down the tempo to let you work, don't be that person who then starts grinding elbows in, snapping on submissions and really just up in the ante because you think they've shown a sign of weakness. Because if you take advantage of that, then they're not going to take too kindly to that. And they will bring intensity back up in a way of I give you an opportunity here to work and you just took advantage of me. Yeah. But it, it's kind of like, uh, I've never thought about it like this before, but it's quite funny. It's like, you know, me and you uh, meet at a party and I go to shake your hand and introduce myself and you kick me in the nuts. <laughs> yeah. That's just, that is essentially what is happening. Pretty much, yeah. So are you going to like that person or not? <laughs> Hell no. No. If you've got an opportunity and you're capable of fucking that person up after they've just kicked you in the nuts, are you going to do it? Of course. Yeah, exactly. So In the most <laughs> drawn out, painful way. Yep. Like, I'll probably scaffold and diaphragm crush. So, just think about it carefully. Is the kick in the nuts worth the punishment that's going to come afterwards? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many sound bites in here that we can use for the title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but to Sai's point on a, uh, an equally serious note, because my, my point was very serious. I think it was, actually. Um, yeah, always match your partner's intensity. Yeah. yeah. Whether that's a higher or a lower intensity, like, match it. And yeah. You'll get a lot more out of it that way. It's like um, you're only as fast as your slowest runner, and like, you're on running teams. So you're gonna match the slower tempo rather than matching the higher tempo. And there's another point to that as well, isn't there? Like somebody might be going on a slow tempo because they might have a bit of an injury or mm. or something like that. And maybe they've not told you at the beginning of the round. Um, you should tell your partners at the beginning oh, of the course, round. Of course, yeah. And also that's another point as well. If it is your first couple of times, be like, you know, it's, you know, it's my first time rolling or you know, I've only been coming a couple of weeks. And um, somebody who might have just had a tough round if they don't know who you are, or maybe you're at a new club or something like that, like they might be coming into the round like, right, we're going to have it. And it's, oh, it's my first couple of weeks, mate. You're like, can, can we just work some stuff that I know? Mm. And then, you know, you'll do it in the context of sparring, but yeah. that'll immediately just bring the intensity down to something that you're comfortable with. Because actually that uh, that's one of the most off-putting things is like when you're in, being introduced to jiu-jitsu and maybe you're not used to that physical closeness and... Uh, like, it's getting semi-aggressive, isn't it? It's like, you know, somebody being up in your face is a bit aggressive and intimidating. Um, that can be something that puts people off very early yeah. on, is, like, not building up a good tolerance to it. Um, so, like, oh, don't be afraid to just say it's my first couple of weeks and start off easier. But 
a side note to that would also be don't shy away from increasing the intensity and oh yeah uh, expose yourself to it's like exposure therapy isn't it mm. you know, the more you do it the more comfortable you're going to get with it yeah and then another side note to that as well if there are players who are preparing for competitions don't be offended if they don't want to roll with you mm. like they've got an expectation of their training sessions and if they decide not to roll with you due to they want a certain level of roll or they might want a rest round or like or they don't want to spend the round coaching don't be offended it's it's they're, they're pursuing a personal goal there as well um and it's nothing against you it's just at that moment in time that level of role doesn't fit their current goal so it's just bear that in mind as well with certain players if they, if they don't seek you out for a role it's not ignorance it's not them being rude it's them prioritizing their training time for their upcoming goals yeah you might find that a couple of weeks down the line when that person's competed that they're much more relaxed and probably are going to be one of the more experienced people in the club mm. and they're probably going to be you're going to learn a lot from them yeah if you get an opportunity to roll with them so you know it's a time and a place for things isn't it mm. um so and what do you think about clubs where uh they won't let white belt spa what do you what do you think of, i think i know what i think i know what you think about it but uh, let's get it on let's get it on the mic um it depends how new or white belt they are so when i'm doing say my fundamentals classes it will be situational sparring so if we're learning side control that week it's going to be all about side control attacks and side control defense and they're going to be the isolated rounds um and if it's guard it's going to be guard defense versus guard offense um but i do encourage them everyone to go to the open mat classes because you're going to learn a lot more in open mat during your first few months than you will like at each individual class because you're exposing to more different varieties of techniques you can ask the questions that may not have arised to you in classes and in the fundamentals classes there's a sort of curriculum to follow so if we're looking at guard and you want to learn more about mount still go to your guard classes but then you can ask about mount during the open mat mm -hmm. um but like you said like you mentioned earlier if you are new let everybody you roll with know oh it's my first couple of weeks i'm quite new to this um so just bear with me yeah if you're not sure what um the difference between rolling or sparring and situational sparring is uh quite simply like we talked about drilling a specific technique in the class with situational sparring like it, you, there's not really an opportunity to get uncomfortable with something mm. that you're not familiar with because it will always be the position that you've been doing in the class yeah so like so i said if you're doing or whatever you know if it's uh scissor sweeps i'll just use the same example as before all that's going to happen is if you perform the sweep on the person and you'll reset into the same position mm. and it's just opportunity to just drill 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 it's almost like we were saying before techniques with lower resistance for practice and then this is that techniques with higher resistance yeah but it's not quite free sparring where there's a possibility for anything to happen it's a very boxed in one scenario um high intensity mm. but one scenario so as soon as you're out of that you're back in yeah so it's kind of a form of drilling uh, a different intensity is uh, it's sparring yeah so it's, it's it's on the border between high level drilling and sparring yeah it's sort of on on that boundary so yeah. it's creates more familiarity as well for the position for the newer people so like it's nothing to be get worked up about if you hear the word sparring or like situational sparring because you've done it yeah like it's what you've been doing in the class so don't stress out about it yeah now open sparring might be a completely different thing because there's so many different possibilities that can happen mm. but if like as i said you just say oh me i only know scissor sweep then your partner's probably gonna let you just drill that yeah yeah um and then after sparring some what happens usually at the end of the class some people might have a chat they might line up shake hands might be more formal less formal mm. um some people like to stay around and have a chat at the end of a session as well don't they and then that's yeah. another opportunity to 
learn a bit more as well. Yeah, um, and getting to know the people you're training with. Yeah. Like, chat to them, ask their name, ask them about their personal lives, like, get to know them, because you're going to spend a lot of time with them, so you might as well get to know them. Yeah, it's, um, you know, everyone's blown off quite a bit of steam by the end of the session. Usually everyone's pretty relaxed. Yeah. Um, some people might some people might just go home yeah. early because they've got stuff on at home or whatever, they've got family life. Other people might want to stay for 20 minutes and talk. Um, they might not even be back talking about jiu-jitsu. No. Um, because you've got to think as well, and we've spoken about this before, these people might have known each other for five years, ten years, like you become good mates. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just about... Have, turn it up, having fun, learning something, but like making a group of friends that you enjoy spending your time with. Yeah. Because it's always more fun and enjoyable to go and do something when you're in an environment when you're having fun. Like I said, put the fun in fundamentals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and on that note, if you've got any more questions with regards to the first couple of weeks and starting Jiu Jitsu, feel free to put them in the comments. Drop us a message at the Grapplers Academy on Facebook and Instagram. Um, they've got Bonafide PT, Coach by Sai, and we'll see you next week.